looking broadly at medicine and food and health and happiness. And that's what we do. You can find us on Patreon and we would love you to join to help us. Just a tiny bit of support every month would be most, most, most appreciated. You can also find us. Where else can they find us? Anywhere on you listen YouTube. to your podcast. Uh, uh, Patreon, well. patreon.com yes. forward slash yeah. oh. pet medics. Um, and so, yeah, any any help you can give us is absolutely great. But we are going to do this for free anyway, because not everybody uh, has the ability to give that small contribution. So, guys, we really, really appreciate it. And everybody who supports us on Patreon, we we really appreciate that we give you a little nugget at the end if i can get these guys to shut up at 1945 then we we jump over to patreon to give you a special little 10 11 12 minutes of extra spice to 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 just say thank you very much to you so guys how have you been in the last week brendan what have you been up to how are the goats oh well yeah thanks connor i have to say thank you because since last week and um, there's been a wonderful facebook post uh, about my uh birthday thank you very much for everybody who responded uh thank you connor for those wonderful graphics uh can't wait till your birthday <laughs> in april I, uh, <laughs> I, I, laughed at, I laughed at my own post it's my birthday brendan clark <laughs> <laughs> yeah guys oh, describe sorry. it describe it for me and for those listening on podcasts and uh, guys thank you for supporting us on the podcasts um it's great to have you there you can listen to us you can't see the, the yeah. beauty and the marvel of this show but you can certainly hear you can enjoy what we're up to. Coming, so, coming Connor, what did you do? What did you do? I, uh, I got a picture of Brendan Clark and I uh, put some cool <laughs> balloons behind it. Spent ages on this picture, actually. It was a high end, you know, doodling on your phone. It's not going to lead to exact, but I think I got pretty close to an appropriate celebration outside in the field. So, uh, yeah, a few balloons, a little hat. And then on the message, I, I put the picture up on Raw Pet Medics and I said, it's my birthday, Brendan Clark. <laughs> <laughs> and half the people guess this is Connor, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, Thank you, hands down. I mean, uh, everybody wanted to know was I smoking a joint? Was I yeah. uh, blowing those, those hooters? Uh... Or was yeah. I was I chewing a stick of celery? I mean, yeah. just that good. Haven't they been at birthday parties? Has not have not seen those party blowers. <laughs> um, that was my effort at it anyway. But yeah, so that was good. How old are you, Brad? Tell everyone. Old enough. <sighs> old enough. Bloody hell. What'd you do for your birthday? Uh went uh down to Cornwall. Uh I stayed okay. over in Devon at Moddy Lambert. Thank you, Moddy. A wonderful stay. Um I actually interviewed a friend of her, Bella, um, uh, is somebody who's doing regen farming in the neighboring farm. Uh, cool. So yeah. interviewed her, so I've recorded that. So I'm going to release that as a gem on Patreon for everybody. Oh, you uh, so uh, we can uh, enjoy that. Um, and uh, yeah, just had a great time. Went on to Cornwall, um, met up with some friends and a friend, uh, of ours got married down on the very southern tip so mm. we were uh, down there for a long weekend and then I've zigzagged my way back up through Oxford and Gloucester and got myself back here for today so very nice yeah wonderful that sounds like a nice nice little uh, easy trip yeah 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 it was great it was great nice good stuff so um and you Connor what have you been up to um, I'm not sure if I've done anything exciting. Uh, not nothing that he's allowed to tell us. <laughs> yeah, no, nothing, nothing exciting happens anymore. I, I've been, I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to be healthy for the last 16 days, and uh, it's getting easier. I'm on the other side of it now, so I don't feel, mm. I don't feel the pangs of my red wine at night time. That was very, very difficult, I have to say. And uh, I have to say, I broke the sugar thing a few times. Um, that hasn't been absolutely perfect, but I'm not going to give in. I think the temptation is. Oh, these orange chocolate Kit Kats, guys, orange flavored Kit Kats. Oh, they're so good. And they're kind of small. And because of four, uh, so Holly on Fridays has a long day doing a thing and she gets a little treat in her lunchbox. Easy peasy. But you can't have those in the house because I will find them. I can smell them a mile away. And uh, so, yeah, as soon as I started finding them, Elaine hides them from me, but I couldn't find them. So a few little hiccups. Besides that, things have been good. Yeah, yeah, things have been good. I have a little bit of self-promotion. I... Uh, 
launched a course over the weekend. I have a new website, drconnorbrady.com, and it's where I'm moving all my courses and a few other bits and pieces that I'm going to be doing. And um, that is a nice little um, kind of, uh, what you call it, app for, for, for running a website. Check it out, guys, if anybody's thinking of doing something similar. It's really cool, but it's very easy to use. So I've got my course up on that. It was an introduction to raw feeding, a masterclass for three hours long, and I gave it out for free, and I had 2,000 people did it to completion. So uh, I think that kind of backfired because nobody else is going to pay for it now. That's all my fans. <laughs> and uh, so that's that dead in the water for a year. But uh, so, yeah, that was the first thing that was happening. And also I'm getting ready for, um, I have a new, in that, course you'll see a new product coming out called power paste and that's coming out tomorrow morning and so you'll hear me talking about about that so i just wanted to tell everybody listening that those two products are available for people and i do appreciate any support in that kind of respect so that's what i've been working on and it keeps you up because you get a flood of little issues that happen and things you don't think about and blah blah blah, blah. so it's a learning diana, diana's just said she watched it twice so you've got to so you've got to take it off yeah, once yeah, you know so, yeah you owe yeah. me rub yeah. out one of the marks yeah <laughs> oh yeah what about you nick anything anything groovy happening i have just dis- discovered a podcast by a ahmed malik dr a h m a d dr ahmed malik and he is a glaswegian he, he's a pakistani glaswegian which makes things pakistani interesting from the start and he uh, got slightly disillusioned with the NHS, came out. He's a p- consultant, you know, a really gifted foot and ankle surgeon. And he has been on a journey looking into alternative medicine, alternative approaches to preventing disease without putting too fine a point on it. And talking to the great and the good, he's a very, very, very good interviewer. Um, and so I've been listening to his podcasts incessantly i'm on probably number 66 i've only missed out about six or seven where of does, them done about where do you get the time it's mad isn't it when you find something you like you just absorb it it's oh mad. my goodness yeah. just it, the, 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 the interviews he i started with nick hudson who's a big thinker in 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 very many kind of health spaces and then i went right back to the beginning i thought this guy is so good and if he's got that level of uh, your brains yeah. and, 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 and uh, you know, spiritual knowledge and, and, you know, drive for humanity. Everybody's there saying, you know, humanity is having a crisis. What can we do? This is what we need to do. Wake up and all this kind of stuff. And so that's it. So I've done about, must have done about 70 hours in the last yeah. 10 days or so. And yeah, it's nice. absolutely divine. It's I'm just mainlining it. It's like a warm hug when you find somebody, uh, you know, it's just that kind of speaking a bit of sense that you, at least you agree with anyway, I suppose. Mm. Everyone Mm. thinks the same, you know, no matter what side of the fence you're on about any debate. But uh, it is like a warm, comforting hug where you go, yeah, that's right. That's exactly it. Oh, ask him that question. He did. Oh, very good. I did notice, and I don't don't, um, speak about the war here too much, but the very first parliamentary debate was had today on excess deaths, and you can check it out on YouTube. It was had in Mm. UK by Andrew Bridgen, and uh, that's the first time anywhere. So it's the first parliamentary debate, and it was had today. And it's uh, there is a lot of great videos on it. You should check out the stats and the figures and seventeen MEPs standing beside them. So uh, oh, it's, it's amazing. It's it's, it's it's growing a little bit, but that's, that's very interesting, guys. To, unless you, Nick, are you finished? You yeah, like no, no. I'm just just going to put this up just so that you've got. Ten I just want to show because images. Paint, about paint, <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. Oh, I can't do that. Let me go like that. Let me go like that. Oh, are, you, are you listening to a podcast guys, now, Nick? Yeah, he's, yeah, yeah he is. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just put that up there. This is him. He's a lovely yeah. fella. I just absolutely love him. So yeah. can you see that? Doc Malik, and it's called yeah. uh, what's it called? Good Health, words, but we'll be fine. Third. Yeah. <laughs> Health. Doc, Doc Malik, you can't can't go wrong. Type it in, you'll find it. Honest Health yeah. is the is yeah. the and it's a podcast, but it's it's on YouTube and everything else. I am going on about it, and it's absolutely deliberate. Exactly. If you like it, you'll love it, and if you if you if it's not really your cup of tea, it's not offensive. It really is very clever. You know, clever people talking about clever stuff in a really quite light way. Yeah, and cool. um, 
So there we so go. Let's let's talk about tonight tests. Um, and yeah, yeah, blood tests and standards. So uh, I think really great that uh, Connor, you've brought this up, and mm. I'm going to share some graphics. So we might disappear off the screen temporarily while we get these okay. graphics up. Um, but I think uh, it's really worth going through this at this point because so many people come to me, Nick, and you, Connor. Uh, you know, just I'm sure to so many others with scary blood that they think are scary. And there's just some elementary things that we need to address. So we're yeah. gonna go through some bloods tonight. So Connor, mm. do you wanna set us up with um, what this particular case was? Yep. And, um, okay. and just the setup, and then we'll go through the initial re results and then we'll talk yeah. about that. Yeah, cool. Uh, okay, so this was a, a, a little, you can, have you got a bigger picture there? I have. I'm going to just... Of the actual units that were involved. Uh, yeah. So first of all, just say this. So this is the particular, the first test, wasn't it, on the 2nd of January? Yeah, I, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 2nd of January. Okay. So you, you've got this, you know, advancing dog. He's 12 years old, Lurcher. And uh, he comes in for... Uh, now, the dog had been exhibiting uh, a bit more sleeping, a bit more eating, couldn't actually satiate the dog. So seemed to be really, really hungry. That seemed to be the outward clinical sign. And uh, and then drinking a bit, but not excessively at all. And there wasn't that many other symptoms really, but she, the, the girl is uh, very clued in. And so she took bloods and these were the first initial bloods that the uh, vet presented her with. And um, the conclusion was uh, um, um, that the dog was possibly in chronic kidney disease and that the food that she was on, raw dog food, probably wasn't suitable for the dog and that the dog now needed a low protein diet, which, you know, we don't need to get into again. We've done the kidney bit a number, numerous times, but the whole low protein bit, uh, you know, for kidney disease, for chronic kidney disease, if you're not in protein urea, like, you know, uh, this whole idea of low protein was the was the information that the vet gave, and then the the client kind of said, mm, "I don't really agree with that information." And the vet said, "Okay, well, do something and come back to us in in two or three weeks." So she contacted me, and I got these bloods, and I'm having a look at these, and we can go through each one of these. Although they make sense, the bottom ones make sense. Some of the top ones are letters that people might poorly understand, but you can see some of these things like urea and creatinine on the bottom of those four red ones there. They're just on the high bracket, you know, they're just there and they're in red and the big word high, which is scary. And you go, oh, God, you're increasing in. But I'm thinking, OK, this is a raw fed dog. We know that they would be close enough to the top of that green line, to the right hand side of that green line, because they eat more protein. Gene Dodds has showed us that if you eat more protein, you have more protein in your blood. Stands to, stands to reason. The, the normal where these bloods are coming from are dry fed dogs who are fed the minimum amount of protein, which is 18 to 20 percent protein dry food. So they don't have a whole lot of protein whizzing around their blood, it seems. So raw fed dogs can be 30 percent higher in urea and creatinine, which begs the, the question, maybe these control, these kind of values and norms and confidence intervals don't actually apply exactly to raw fed dogs. Where might they be if we had more accurate information? So I said, OK, look, don't panic. Don't panic. This 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 uh, initial question is, you know, uh, with the extra and the albumin is a bit up there. So my initial question will be, uh, you know, was these bloods fasted? Did the like how what how what was the distance between the meal, which is full of protein? And she goes, Oh, I fed the dog in the morning, it was his birthday, and he got four eggs and a big meaty treat uh, <laughs> three three hours before the bloods. And I said, Well, there's the protein because you're measuring what he just ate, and he just had a high protein meal. So that calls into massive questions. And then the follow on question is, OK, there's a few little liver readings that are up and this gets into veterinary territory, which I poorly understand. All I know is that, you know, if I took a chemical worm or, or I did something, I'd go, well, yeah, maybe the liver has to do a little bit of scrubbing or maybe he's on medication. Right. Maybe he's on pain. Before, before yeah. we go, then, therefore, too far into, um, you know, what you did and where we got to, I think we yeah. should, uh, you know, just maybe help some guys understand those columns and those rows a little okay. bit more and okay you know, I think if we maybe go through those nick um and yeah. you know bring in some some information for everyone there so yeah, I, okay. I think you know if we maybe uh i'm gonna just if, if we blow up the floor. if we if we, right yeah. i'm just gonna go through the top line okay i like as you know i like peter and jane 
approaches because if you can't do Peter and Jane, you are not going to be able to read Shakespeare. Okay, so I'm going to give you the Peter and Jane approach. If you want more, then you know we can we can go there with part two. If you fancy, let's have a look at uh, the total protein, which is uh, within the normal range. Okay, so we look reading from the left hand side. We've got total protein for this date we've re we've removed the vets and the dates and what have you we normally have the, mm -hmm. the dogs and the age and the breed and the owner and the vet who who, who commissioned the re result oh very clever brendan well done so 11 year old male neutered lurcher ah we've got a lurcher puppy and he is, we've called him damien no well his real oh. name's jet i call him okay. damien yeah. Oh, okay. That However, an idea. This is eleven years on. <laughs> yeah. This is eleven years on, and I'm sure he's fantastic. And by the time he's eleven, Jet's eleven. If I'm not in the ground, I will be <laughs> hugging him with great joy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Lurchers, they they they're quite a thing, and they love stealing stuff. But that oh, aside, lovely. let's come back yeah. to the biochemistry. Blood is divided into two 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 major tests. One is the hematology. These are the cells that float around like carrots in vegetable soup okay and the uh biochemistry is what's dissolved in the liquid of the soup if you like are you with me mm. you still with me yeah yeah. Yeah. So yeah yeah if you've got a microscope you can see the hematology if you've got a microscope you can't see the biochemistry the tiny little proteins and and um enzymes buzzing about okay so that's i think just so for, for everybody's um you know uh, enjoyment let's say that we're going to leave hematology tonight and we're going to yes. talk about that yes. next month okay yeah. because i think there's some important things to go on about for that so we're going yeah, to be yeah. very specific but carry on with the chemistry okay. and the biochemistry okay. i think that's yeah cool. okay so if we if we're looking at, at blood as being a bit like minestrone soup you know the thin stuff with the with the little bit of pasta and a little bit of veggies mm. and peas and god knows what in it okay that's a good analogy for blood at a certain level okay so we are looking what's dissolved in the in the liquid right and mm. this is it and it's basically just a big long list of things that are dissolved in the liquid and vets uh, over the years have, have added uh, these these tests so that they can you know have a look under the bonnet so let's just go through total protein initially and then we'll just go through them we'll, we'll we'll go through them in some way after that so total protein the result is 63 and gp per uh, g stroke l is grams per liter okay that's how much solid material is dissolved per liter of the blood okay and just so for all of those joining us from judy morgan's these are uk standard units okay so there are a set of american standard units and we will probably put a post in so that you can look at what the differences are for the standards um between yeah. the uk most, and the americans just so that you're most um, kids are there most give that that image on the right hand side which is fairly you know a, an eyeball representation for the plebs like me non-vets we look at that thing on the right you know it's a little graph for people listening, listening on podcasts it's unfortunate we're just looking at an excel file here of, uh, of blood results but the image on the right will be the same for american dogs as will be for irish mm. and uk dogs mm. we'll get that idea uh, of he's a bit high so really interestingly it also varies depending on the machine that's used Indeed. and okay. how they present it so i do find okay. some of the idex machines just for those people out there both the in-house labs and the external labs if it's high they still stick the bar in the middle of the high range which scares the bejesus out of many people because yeah. they think it's way off the top of the scale mm. okay uh, whereas some machines like this one will grade that level of how off the scale it oh, is. Okay. So, okay. It... So just be careful. Don't get scared if your line is suddenly, you know, way top. off the top end. Okay. They just are denoting that it's high, not necessarily. Okay. They, they don't give high. you how. They don't give you an so, idea of how high. Yeah. A representation so it of that. very much depends upon the machine. I've found. So mm. just okay. you know, okay. bear that in mind. So coming back, okay. guys. For, okay. For so just Nick, coming back. I'm still on the first line here. <laughs> Yeah, the first line of 20. <laughs> the first line of 20. Yeah. The, lot, the rest will be a lot because because if I give you the ground rules, you can uh, yeah. interpret it. So right. oh, 63 grams per litre. In the States, it might be different units. Always look at yeah. the units because you can't, you can't 
uh, uh, measure apples against oranges unless you know you've got apples and you can know you've got oranges. OK, if you know what I mean. OK, so units really important. And then you've got the idiot guide over on the right hand side. You've got the reference interval. OK, it looks complicated. It's not. And then you've got the real idiot's guide, which vets use a lot. I'm the first to admit it, okay, which gives you kind of an eyeball. As, as Connor just said, you've got an eyeball as to, are, are, you know, are we in the normal range or are we a bit too high or a bit too low? So the reference range says that total protein should be between 50 and 72 units, okay? And then we look across and we go, aha, total protein is 63, which is nicely within 50 and 72 units. So thank you very much. Okay. And then we look across at the real idiot's guide and lo and behold, it is a bar right in the middle of the green zone. It's not in the upper zone and it's not in the lower zone. That's to just kind of reinforce it. And vets will use this by the, they'll just scan down the idiot's guide and then they'll look back and they'll look to see what the actual figures are to give them a bit more nuance in their in their interpretation. So that's the total protein at the top and that's kind of the, the baseline. Brent, do you want to take on the albumin there and the kind of the significance? Yeah, I think so. The the next part, uh, so it's the albumin, which is effectively the protein within the blood, which is used for for just keeping the concentration, keeping the fact that it's almost osmotically there to keep fluid in the bloodstream. Okay, as a base layer, it does carry some other things. Some things will attach to it um, uh, at various points, but it is basically the protein that keeps the concentration and the fluids within your bloodstream. If you lose too much of that, i.e. you're on a low, low protein diet, you're unable to make it in the liver, or you're losing too much through the gut or the kidneys, then that may become too low. And that's when you can start to have other fluid problems uh, within the bloodstream. OK, too high. It can indicate that you may be slightly dehydrated. So if you've not mm. been drinking properly, then your albumin can go up too high. Or as Connor was alluding to, if you're on relatively higher protein meals, you may end up having more protein within your bloodstream. So it is, mm -hmm. you know, a base layer of albumin. It's what we often would say you'd find in the egg white Okay, uh, as a as the albumin, and yeah, that's why it's called albumin. So it is um, uh, something to be aware of. And when you see this, this level, it's forty one. Okay, so that's just over the range for this machine at these temperatures. That is what they have read between twenty six and forty. They would class as standard. And I'd like to just take this opportunity to introduce something to everybody uh, and everybody's going, oh, my God, he's going to call, mm -hmm. talk, talk statistics. Podcasters um, are but... lucky they can't see this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so this is what they call a standard deviation curve, OK, a bell shaped mm -hmm. curve. And so a general population would normally fit into this normal distribution. OK, mm -hmm. now. What tends to happen is because it all gets a bit messy at the edges and those tails can go on for quite some way, what they do when they design a blood test is that they will look normally around the two standard deviations. So th that's a, a two delta on there, mu equals minus two delta or plus two delta. Um, and that basically means that they have taken the medium, the midline, okay, which is mu, and they have looked at the deviations apart. Now, at two standard deviations, you will roughly have 95.45% of the population. So that is usually what they look at. Because they're looking at the majority of the population, they will look at that as a figure. Now, that is a standard population in most cases for these bloods of a dry fed, starved, morning sampled animal. OK, mm -hmm. and that will then can actually even be specific for, you know, in this case, a canine. OK, for a dog and then even more specific for a breed. And even more specific for a 11 year to 12 year old Indeed. lurcher. 
okay? So you need to understand that the blood results that you've got, now there are some companies in the world, and Gene Dodds I know does this certainly for thyroid levels, um, who will have enough data and enough incentive to actually give you a, something specific for your dog, your age, at your breed. Break it out. Break it out. And break yeah. it out. And so yeah. those those levels may change slightly between you and a friend who has a totally different dog, a totally different age, a totally different breed. So do be aware, those in the example that we have shown here are based on a canine, not on anything more specific. Yeah. Okay. So what you're saying, Ben, is that if you had, you could have two dogs, two very different dogs, different ages, different lifestyles, you know, uh, and they could be eating the same diet with the same amount of protein, but that does not mean they're going to blow the exact same protein in their blood. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing that you've got to understand with uh, these is when you've got that variance and you've taken off the top and the bottom of that curve, a normal dog could still be yeah. in that bottom or top, okay, within the third standard deviation and still be absolutely normal yeah. for your dog in your situation as an individual. So you need to then take, this is the beauty of taking a standard blood in a healthy individual at another time is that you have the standard for your dog at that point in time. So uh -huh. if you then have a massive variance from that, and you know, you can look at this over, you know, six monthly or yearly intervals, you know, whatever floats your boat, that actually can give you a brilliant way of having a comparison for if your dog is poorly. And you can then refer back to when it was normal, what did they look like for your dog yeah and that's the beauty when they're in for a procedure of having the pre-anesthetic bloods done because that's usually when the dog is you know if it's a standard procedure usually when the dog is relatively healthy and not got anything else going on they'll have been starved because of the procedure they will be going in it's useful to sometimes say yes i'll have that not because they're going to change the anesthetic protocol or anything else because they should be taking great care with that regardless, but that they will at least have a standard. You'll have a little anchor for your, you anchor for your dog too. that you can keep on record. You can yeah. ask for those bloods. They're your results. You've paid for them. You can ask for those results, take them home, store them in a file, have them on record yeah. so that at any point in the future, if you go to an emergency vets or anything like that, you've got a comparison with you. I've got a question. I've got a question here. Okay, so this is grams per liter, albumin and yep. globulin, which will be your little globules that Nick was talking about, the bits in his minestrone soup. Okay, and there's a little <laughs> ratio underneath. And the ratio is a little bit wrong because your albumin is a little bit wrong. So your ratio goes a little bit out. But the my question is, um, we know dry-fed dogs drink more and we know raw-fed dogs wee less. OK, so we had this in Australia. The dogs are fed. It was actually fed 1.5 percent salt dry food, which is huge. And that's not including iodized salt, not the other bits and pieces. This was sodium chloride. So it's a huge amount. So we had it in guide dogs that, you know, training, toilet training was a devil because dry fed dogs in a desert drink huge amounts of water and they wee all over the place. So if you're drinking huge amounts of water and weeing all over the place, surely your bloods are going to be different to a raw fed dog that doesn't drink as much or a cat, a dry fed or raw fed cat. Imagine how different those bloods are sure, just purely based on the amount of moisture they're taking in and a cat doesn't drink. Uh, Absolutely. So I was going to say, because what, what's happened is over the years, vets have, have, have taken more and more blood samples from more and more uh, um, healthy dogs, and they just add them to basically a great big database to say, this is normal, this is normal. The thing is, over the last th three, four decades, most dogs have been kibble fed. And so those normals are not the normals for a dog. They are for, generally speaking, for a kibble and canned fed dog okay and so we come along and say well actually we think that feeding raw food is a much better idea species appropriate more physiological more healthy and you know all that stuff but actually as as we all know you get a different dog you get a different dog 
superficially yeah they got shinier coat they got better poos and all that stuff but actually physiologically it will be different and jeans dodds has, has done studies uh and it's worth having a little google bren can you just throw those uh results up there please? the ones that we've got here just here yeah just to say just to yeah. show people and um, what we what we find is that many but not all raw fed dogs you see the a l t there it's about one two three four five six down in black yeah. so in this particular dog raw fed dog the a l t is normal at 50 the speed limit is between 13 and 78 units okay however he is true to form and this might be just an, an effect of having had a meal but we do find many raw fed dogs run at a higher urea le level urea is a byproduct of protein metabolism so if you're eating mm -hmm. loads of amazing protein you're going to have you're going to run at normal at having a higher urea so just one other little thing i when i because i talk i i try and teach my clients about about blood tests because they find them pretty daunting um if we go back, just go back to the albumin for one second. If you see, look, if we say the speed limit, these are the, the reference intervals between 26 and 40. And then you look at the, the idiot guide and it's like, oh my God, it's high. And then you've got right in the middle, which is interesting why they put it there in red, in capitals. It's like, hi, oh my God. But, Scary. but exactly. Mm. But if I said to you that technically doing 71 miles an hour is a crime, on the motorway, this is not not on a little <laughs> village, <laughs> not right? not down past the school. But, but technically, just sticking with the story, yeah. On a motorway or a highway, you guys in the states. So you're on the highway and you're one mile an hour over the limit. Technically, you are breaking the law, but actually, in reality, you're good to go. Yeah, you're driving responsibly. You're only one mile an hour over. That's assuming your speedo is accurate. La, 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 la. Okay, that's the context. So if your albumin is going from 41 to 43 to 47 to 48, that's a whole different story. But if you're just, if you're, if you're on one or two results, you're a 41 and sometimes you're not uh, and it's not going anywhere, that might just be you. As Bren was saying, Everybody has slightly different normal parameters. They're usually there or thereabouts. But if you're 10, 5, 10% above in certain parameters and you're healthy, that might be you. So that's just really, it's, it's, it's context, uh, context dependent. And, and it's really important yeah. to do that so that we don't panic. Because when you panic, yeah. you can't read these things properly. I and I'd love to just bring in at this point. So Gene Dodds, interestingly, uh, published the urea and I think Albumin as, as particularly too. She's not done a full panel for raw feds. Mm. I think there was very much limitations on what she's looked at. Um, yeah. And what I was interested in is then there was a conclusion drawn that urea being high for raw fed dogs would mean that actually there could be a consequential impact for kidney cases and actually i'm yet to see the data that this will cause a deterioration in the yeah. kidneys totally agree it's a raw fed yeah. dog totally agree. that's got a slightly higher urea level i think practically uh, there's some other aspects i mean in this particular case it is so interesting this particular machine doesn't run what we call an SDMA okay. level, okay? Uh, it doesn't, so which looks at kidney damage at earlier points. But if you look at the calcium to phosphorus ratio, that's two to one roughly, okay? That's within normal parameters, and that's where we look at long-term kidney aspects. And you know, just having a high urea creatinine for me. I question, especially when it's just over. And if the albumin is just over and the creatinine is yeah. just over, I look at, is the dog hydrated fully? Is the dog, you know, uh, fasted? And if those two are questionable at all, is it in the morning? Okay. And as we can see from when this sample um, is shown to be done on the first sampling, um, I think really interestingly, look at the time 
okay, mm. next to the date, and that's an afternoon. Um, Why would that change? Why would your bloods change from morning to afternoon if there's no okay, food so, involved? Well, you see, now you have a circadian rhythm. Okay. And so your cortisol levels change. So they should be really high in the morning to wake mm -hmm. us up as humans. OK. Yeah. And then they drift off towards in the afternoon. Having a hormonal change will change what your organs are doing. Okay? OK. And that means that you can have a change in the metabolism. And if that change in metabolism can be significant ah. enough to show changes in these enzymes revealed into the bloodstream. So oh, that's interesting. you have that same circadian rhythm in dogs generally, um, slightly different in cats. So you need to understand that, you know, there's other issues and, you know, we'll come to other stress factors. So things like glucose further down this list, um, you know, in cats particularly, they can be all over the place if you stress the cat prior to, you know, journeying in to have a blood test and your cat, cat gets distressed because, the you know, you drive at 100 miles an hour, um, not 71. Um, over the speed limit. May, yeah, uh, and you're rallying around the corners, okay, then your cat's glucose could be through um, the roof purely and simply because you've had a stress event prior to it having a sample taken so or a cat or a dog who doesn't want to have their blood taken and it takes you yeah. three goes to go that'll get you get that that'll change yeah. things so yeah. so we need to take That's all of the samples in context and i would always look holistically and what i mean by that is looking at all of the parameters as this is the animal in front of you alongside how ill is it at that point in time to understand how important those bloods are or what the likelihood is that they are an anomaly i.e they're abnormal even in a normal case uh, it could yeah. be and we haven't discussed yet lipemia and we haven't discussed hem you know um, lysis of the cells which causes um, effectively the blood to look a reddish color, the serum to look a reddish color. So if we've got hemolysis, so that's breaking down of the red cells, that's that will cause this red shift. That can change how the machine sees the result because the machine is looking at a color change in these reactions. So if you've added a red color dye into that, then of course, purple starts to look brown because there's more red in it yeah all sorts of things you know so you've got to understand that can change it if you've got an excess of bilirubin in the bloodstream okay so that again can change the color so it can affect the result not because the organ is damaged but because there is another color overlying the result yeah Two two bits to add to this, and with a follow on quiz question, I'll uh, I'll ask Nick here. But the uh, the first of all, people will be surprised to see glucose on those readings because this is a raw fed dog that doesn't eat carbs, and it just it just goes to show that you you know these dogs are in a state of producing glucose if and when they need it. So they do have glucose when they need it in their bloods, and it's in a normal range because you don't need to feed them carbs to have glucose in your blood. That's all uh, part of this ketogenesis bit. But uh, do you know what's interesting? Um, uh, just while we're here, although it wasn't an issue for this dog, what would be the reason, I was told to ask, what would be the reason for um, an excessive cholesterol reading in an otherwise healthy dog? Well fasted, all that, ticked all those other boxes. I don't take a lot of uh, stock by mildly increased cholesterol in dogs. People, dog, doctors get very up set whether they should or not is another matter but in the normal dog if they're perfectly healthy healthy I'm, I'm not too worried about that it can be indicative of metabolic issues you know cushing's disease will will, will bump it up um and and other inflammatory issues can okay. can 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 affect it but if you address the primary disease the ibd the pancreatitis something like that you may see because cholesterol is the ambulance yeah if if you look at this is the same with humans as well if you look at 
damaged blood vessels, for example, in humans, you'll always see cholesterol there. Does that mean cholesterol causes the problem? That's how it's been perceived for decades. But mm -hmm. actually, wherever you go see an, uh, 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 an accident on the road, you'll see an ambulance. doesn't mean that the ambulance causes yeah. the accident. Okay, yeah. that's really, really important. So yeah. cholesterol in a nutshell is a bit like the somebody coming along with a sticking plaster. That's kind of, it's a yeah, healing, it's to help. It's vastly to help. important mm -hmm. cholesterol. You couldn't live. And that this, yeah. uh, we, okay. We need to do a show on cholesterol. Yeah, we can't let you go on this one because you can't go on. But, but what I would bring in, it's, it's not high it. cholesterol that's the issue. It's actually the ratio of triglycerides to cholesterol that's important. And if you find that your triglyceride level is on a ratio of less than two to one to cholesterol, then actually you are probably more likely to have a good health outcome. It's only when you elevate your triglycerides up to five to one to cholesterol that actually you start to see health impacts for humans. And it's not the cholesterol that's the problem. It's often that either it's oxidized cholesterol, so it's been damaged, okay, or that you've got an excess of triglycerides to cholesterol ratio. Oh. And that's the only ones that they can show there's an impact. For those that have just looking at cholesterol, high cholesterol, they cannot correlate that with disease, not even for heart attacks. Mm -hmm. So it is actually the ratios that become important. And even more importantly, which type, you know, are they low density, very oh, low density, yeah. I think we and do a show whether on that. they are oxidized or not. So we're yeah. going to come to cholesterol separately. Do yeah. not concern yourselves um, with that in this. Particular so cholesterol, part. generally not a big deal. No, most of it's produced by your own body. 80% of your cholesterol that, that's on the scene is produced by your own body. He was trying totally. to help. The, um, guys, let's, we've only got three or four minutes here, and we've got, yeah. I've got uh, some questions here that I've been told to ask you, but I'm going to okay. do that as the teaser to get us into part two. Can we just Oof. skip to the next readings? Oh. I, are we are we going to skip to the next readings or do they want to watch those on Patreon and see what you did? Ooh, I, I have other readings. bits. I want to, right, okay. <laughs> to discuss about um, uh, kind of uh, periods and and how it affects bloods and that kind of stuff. Uh, I found a okay. bit of cool information on that. It's not just the the sexy hormones that change throughout the month. Um, so I had it, okay. and also I've got some questions I want to ask you guys. But let's just have a look at the, the readings. I, I also asked yeah. this person when I saw a slight few um, issues with may, maybe um, with, with liver readings, I thought, okay, did you give the dog any drugs? Which is a really important question. You know, what what drugs is the dog on? Uh, because that will throw your bloods out in ways I don't understand, but that these lads will, that Bren and Nick will. And she said that she was given the dog gabapentin for, for arthritis and not known to be a huge uh, impact of the liver. There's plenty online, plenty of case studies to show that gabapentin can have a, have an effect on the liver uh, in, in some okay. dogs, in some situations, whatever. Um, this dog had could gabapentin I, two, could two I, hours. Could I just say, so certainly medications can affect bloods, but yeah. just for fear, please do not stop gabapentin as a painkiller for your dog yeah. without mm. your health professional talking to you carefully and you asking them very honestly about what is the importance of that as a pain relief for your dog. Yeah, I certainly would agree. Certain medications prior to bloods can affect them. But let's not necessarily concentrate. But you could, on give, you could give your you could give your pain relief the day before. You know what I mean? If you're going in for bloods, don't be putting a wormy tablet or a gabapentin or whatever. Anything that might cause yeah. a little bit. You know, it's not needed that morning. Surely to God, you don't need to take gabapentin every day, do you? Is that the way it goes? Um, yeah. yeah, looking yeah. at yeah, you've got to look at the pharmacokinetics. That's a big word for meaning Ooh. how your body uses that drug, how it's absorbed, how it's got rid of. Okay, okay. Um, and therefore you need to understand that there are distinct intervals between dosing that should be maintained. Cool. Uh, yes, of course, they need to look at any medications that use that and the effects they could have on bloods and not mistaken, you know, let's say a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, they may cause the gut to bleed when you've given it. And if they do that, of course, your blood urea nitrogen could be high purely because mm -hmm. that blood is seen as protein in the gut and it would be processed and raised the blood urea nitrogen. Yeah. So that's an example. Yeah, so let's good. let's be understanding so, that drugs could affect it. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, it's not it's yeah, so it's it's a, but it's not a, necessarily in this case. 
Yeah, not necessarily. Who knows? All we know is that we asked this dog to fast properly. Uh, in this case, as Bren pointed out, the last bloods are taken at 4 p.m. This is at 10 a.m. So that's a large discrepancy if you go with this diurnal bit. Turns out zinc is the most effective nutrient uh, when it comes to diurnal uh, patterns of uh, morning and evening bloods. I was just Googling. Um, but yeah, zinc. And actually, they didn't find much difference in the other minerals. But uh, that's not to say all these other bits won't be affected in protein levels, which I didn't look at. Um, so uh, anyway, this dog has been well fasted and uh, took up bloods in the morning. So there was no medications given before. For. and suddenly all these worrying ratios all these red lights have turned off so nothing else has changed the dog's on the same diet now bearing in mind the the the, vet, the person had gone out with thinking the dog has chronic kidney disease he was going to be put on chronic kidney disease dry food and probably, yeah, potentially that's the route the dog was going down then and you know now just from some simple kind of changes like hang on fast the hell out of the dog and let's see where we are the red lights have turned off. The, the, the albumin globulin ratio is still a touch little wonky, but that's because the albumin ratio, her albumin is up at the, you know, 38. This dog clearly has a high albumin going through its blood and globulin is very low. And so when you do that ratio, it's a tiny bit high. I wouldn't be wet in the bed about it. It doesn't seem too dramatic. And then, uh, you know, everything else seems pretty, pretty okay beyond kind of stressing about it. Um, so, so, you know... Connor, just to say, this is the same dog everything's the same later. it's just exact fasted same. two weeks later fasted. that's fasted it fasted two weeks later and then the person rings me and goes bloody hell because she was so worried you know right. and she's like there you go the dog is and, and also a few other little changes in the dog like the dog wasn't drinking water uh a whole lot of water in the first one which you guys alluded to it's, which is nine look, days later in fact nine it's days not, there we yeah. go yeah okay. um so it like there was there was very little interventions one little thing or two of the things i was getting them to do was offer the dog fresh water or salty water see if there's any electrolytes were needed by the dog because they would know and uh you know a little bit of algae a little bit of kind of chlorella which can help top up vitamin levels and you know offer it separately and so there was probably a tiny bit of that on in the background but food wise and whatever else i put their mind at ease because studies show of dogs that have been nephrectomized. So this is where they actually chop off the kidney function of the dogs, representing 70% kidney function loss, 80 and 90% stage one, two, three, whatever. And the more protein they fed these dogs, the better they did. So even the idea of feeding them low protein food was, was kind of wrong. But this person said, no, I'm going to keep on feeding the normal diet. I'm going to see what the second blood say. And now they have these second bloods to go by and go, ah. And uh, I, I wonder, I always wonder what the vet thought when, when that was presented to them you know without trying to rub their face in it you're not no one's trying to do that you're just trying to say bloody hell you're still saying low protein for dogs with early stage kidney disease like that's desperate you know so that kind of annoyed me a little bit that a pleb like me could could give that advice and and you know why isn't that advice filtering down um you know you're paying for the advice for people to read these bloods for us because this shit is complicated you know and then you know um are they are they interpreting the bloods correctly for my raw fed dog well how can they because they don't have the numbers and controls and data and it's certainly not being fed to them in college so it's a little bit worrying i wonder where we are with normals and where do we go from here how do you get normal blood read you know well we need what to get need thousands really of normal bloods from uh, loads of healthy raw dogs so that we can uh, sell and, them and you own. need you need to make sure that it is marked that this is a raw dog so that yeah. they can differentiate from yeah. this is a kibble fed dog yeah. i mean Maybe realistically yes. they should yeah. they should separate out the different kibbles because they will have different protein levels yeah, true. they'll have true. you know there's so yeah. many changes in some of those but generally they're all processed and i can't wait till we start to move into the functional medicine side of things with these normal parameters this is so archaic we've been doing bloods like this for the past 40 years with very little change in veterinary medicine without looking at inflammatory markers without looking at you know that some of the um, cancer markers that are now available without looking at hormone metabolism without looking at you know, all yeah all the vitamin levels that are within the bloodstream yeah so all of that is becoming available now for functional medicine practitioners there's so much information yeah. you can More, gain yeah, which outstrips all of this that we're seeing here yeah. and even now unfortunately we're still misreading some of the basics that we've had 40 years yeah. to get hold of yeah um so i think can, can i can, can i ask you guys because i'm, I'm just aware of one guy we're yeah. tight in time here one person here has got a very interesting question she says can i ask 
uh, bladder cancer was not detected in my dog who had bloods three weeks before her death. She was being treated for a UTI and she had two ultrasounds that showed no tumour. So how can bloods not show that? I mean, her bloods were totally normal three weeks before her death from bladder cancer. Many cancers will not show on a blood. Oh, will they not? Yeah, no, we're not if, if, you go, <clears throat> if you go fishing for cod, you're not gonna you're not gonna get sardines. Yeah, if, and and there you, are. You know two, what I mean? Is that a decent, is that a good yeah, analogy? Yeah, is. and there are. Two Unless you look for sardines, tests. you're not going to find sardines. Okay. Yeah. 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 So there are cancer there are, markers, but yeah, but there are two new tests that are out there mm. that are now being looked at. Okay. Mm. Um and. Yeah, the BRAF test, there's new Q, these, but they're specifically saying, okay, we've ruled everything out, but we're suspicious of cancer. Um, you need to get those specific tests. They're quite expensive, puts people wow. off. You know, if you're okay. spending um, yeah, 150 to 200 yeah. pounds for a test trying to screen cancer, yeah. you, you're going to be a little bit, you know, oh, do I really want to go down that route? Um, and so... You know, looking at a general bloods is really looking at organ function. And for certain spread, you might find that you have some changes, maybe in the liver, okay, maybe in the kidneys. But generally, majority of cancers, you're not going to see changes unless it's fairly marked. And okay. Okay, yeah. that's disappointing. I kind of thought that you guys would be able to, it would just pop, it would hop off the readings, like, you know, platelets would be down or nah. it'd be like, oh, that's definitely what it is. Look, you know? hematology comes into it. It's back to the holistic view. Okay. But then you've got to look at what is the clinical picture? What are you, your examination? So just reading bloods on its own in isolation isn't really what you should be doing. You should be reading them with the patient in front of you. Uh, having urine from that bladder cancer case may have made a massive difference oh, to yeah. the diagnostic works, nice. you know, because you can see what's going on with that. So there's loads of other information that can come forth and you've got to work out, look, they're often these are a start point. Yeah. Then it's a progression of if your dog is ill, maybe it's got weight loss, but the these initial bloods are normal. Follow your vet's advice as to the next set of tests because right. your dog is not normal. It's losing yeah. weight. It's looking yeah. poorly. It might be straining to urinate. It's got is your, normal is your organs. analysis is your analysis not cheap for detecting uh, the likes of yeah. Oh well, you, you know, can certainly cancer. pick up you know on a dip test. You can you know addition to this maybe as little as. 40 pounds you know even 20 pounds to do yeah. uh, that with the lab uh, and to get some more information about if there's cells coming out in the urine which if they've got bladder cancer generally there would be if yeah. there's changes in um the the biochemistry or the the bacterial levels etc within that not to be suddenly mistaken for that there is you know, a, a cystitis, a bacterial infection, it could be that there's a secondary infection around the cancer. Mm. So, you know, how is that collected? Is it collected by free catch, which means that all of the lower urinary tract and discharges could be collected in it? Or is it by direct sampling from the bladder? You know, all of these have yeah. really important methods of, of understanding for um, why this turns out that uh, that normal. Veterinary stuff is complicated. Who would have thought? I just, Who would have thought it? I thought anybody could do it, but uh, I have to say my brain's hurting a bit. Um, <laughs> should, we, should we jump over to Patreon, where I will create, where you can hear three men uh, discuss uh, the menstrual cycle? I think. Have you got, have you got uh, <laughs> some teasers? No. Oh, teasers. Yeah. Well, my my teaser, my my main question is, what nutrients? Uh, so taking bloods from um, women and uh, certain times of the month. And so we expect things to change. So the obvious, the low hanging fruit here would be all the all the sexy Iron. hormones. Okay, they're all gonna oh you do, oh Nick's just jumped the gun. Okay, so save your save your guesses, and I'm looking for three, <laughs> actually four, top nutrients that will fluctuate wildly depending on whereabouts you are in your cycle. So yeah, but you, you say go. that, Connor. But I bet every woman in the audience just went knows the answer to this. Okay, Iron. Yeah. Iron. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, we can get a bit more fancy than that. However, I do have to go and have put children to sleep, so I'm going to leave you two lovely boys. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
to do, to, I, I to, hope to, he to, meant to bed and not literally, because yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. otherwise people are going to have a very strange view of you, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> how, how, tell, us, tell us the temperature in your house at the moment, Nick. Oh God, it's freezing. Look, look. Yeah. Look Your at this. Kids. I'm wearing yeah. I'm wearing a vest. Freezing house and no sweets. My a god. T-shirt. Yeah. A jumper. <laughs> and a woolly jumper. And I've got long johns on. And I'm just <laughs> about right. <laughs> I Why don't you put the heating on, man? Put light a fire. <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> We've done that all day. It's sub zero. It's literally yeah, sub zero. That's why the kids are going to bed at eight o'clock because yeah. they need to wrap up in a quilt to keep yeah. warm. Yeah, <laughs> like, been, yeah they look like seems... the Inuit going to bed. Like <laughs> yeah, all sleeping together in one bed like a roll down book. <laughs> and with the dogs, the dogs do yeah. sleep in with Ellie. Yeah, for oh, sure. Very nice. Heaven, very nice. To, heaven forbid you ever go to Canada and it's minus 20 outside right now. Can't do that on three dog night. Uh, Brent, oh, yeah. they call it a three yeah. dog night. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing, nice. brilliant. Like it. All right, Nick, take it easy, yeah, guys, and uh, thanks everybody. Really, really okay. good. Uh, I, we need to do hematology. Uh, 